Welcome to today's talk. It's by San Vivienne, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Creative Agency and Digital Ethnography Research Center at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, known as the RMIT. Uh, that's the University of Melbourne, Australia. Their principal expertise is digital self-representation, online activism, queer identity, and rhetorical strategies and feminist practices for speaking and listening across difference. Uh, the title of the talk is Code Switching Identities, Curating Networked Presence. Please welcome Son Vivian. This is an invitation to think about the way we describe ourselves. Is it age? Is it race? Class? Gender? Um, how much do these things change over time? Are uh, all of these descriptions of self evident in your body? Or might they be things other people project upon you? Um, what about in your online trace? Are they things that you change in different spaces? Um, a lot of the young people that I work with, for example, might have one profile space on Facebook and then three or four or five others on Tumblr. Um, and they'll think about those Tumblr spaces as being authentic representations of their, of different aspects of self, but they're very intentionally fragmented and there's no discussion about one identity being more truthful or more authentic than the others. Um, I have a slide that kind of breaks down some of these uh, conventions and cliches, I guess, about the online versus in real life. Um, and my argument really is that this is a false binary now and it really is in many ways um, equivalent to a, a gender binary in that there's fluidity and movement across the spaces and one space imbricates and influences the other. So a lot of this work really comes out of um, thinking through what happens when you, when you map the false binary of online in real life to uh, increasingly problematic and perhaps always non-existent, you know, imposed binary um, across genders. What I really try and look through and for, and so the first kind of half of this talk is, is around uh, the emergence or apparent emergence of uh, non-binary gender diversity, um, situating that in some of the politics and the, the sort of social backlash to things like they pronouns, and in the second half of it I start to talk a little bit about some of the case studies and field work that I'm doing. Um, I've got a tricky thing in this slide that doesn't actually start until about 30 seconds in, because that's my timing, but I'm never sure whether it's actually going to happen, and then I want to press the button and see if it happens, and see, I think it's not going to happen, I think I've left it too long. Let's see if it happens when I press the button. I can tell you about it. Basically, out of the multiple fragments, there, see it's starting to happen, okay. <laughs> There's another version of me that emerges simply through a reframing and a superimposition. So some of the creative work that I'm doing is around uh, thinking through, yes, and see, then it jumps into the next one. I've got to get the timing right for that. Is thinking through um, how we can curate our identities across these multiplicities and fluidities in, in ways that are really proactive and positive rather than um, things that are really stigmatised and I'm sure that you will also have politicians who've, you know, they've been accused of flip-flopping because they've, and flip-flopping being a thong, an Australian, you have these things too, I think you call them sandals? Flip-flops. Flip-flops, okay, so that's the Americanism, we, we, we call them thongs, but politicians get accused of flip-flopping because they learn something new and change their mind as if that's a bad thing. It's seen as being you know, an incoherent representation of self that what you said before must be a lie and you're actually being inauthentic, we shouldn't vote for you. So, so a lot of this work looks through you know, actually the reality that we're all multiple, we're all fragmented, we're all fluid, and, and I'll give you lots of argumentation for why this is the case, um, and what happens if we actually take that on and celebrate that. Um, I dare say, I'm not going to dwell upon the, the gender 101 aspect too much because I'm thinking that there's a little bit of awareness around that already here. <laughs> so apologies to have to kind of even bring it back, but I always know that assuming that everybody understands everything is also a, a problem. Um, so this is, this is a very uh, typical kind of um, 
resource that we'll see circulating in spaces like Tumblr, um, and some of the work that I've done is in, in Tumblr as a particular space and its usefulness for young people in a, in a kind of very intense period of their lives where they're finding out lots of information and working out who they are and where they fit. So this is a kind of resource that breaks down um, what have been binaries into continuums and then splits away from sex assigned at birth, female, male, they do at this stage other and intersex, but we know in the GLBTQIS acronym and plus and asterisk that, that the identities that might be in that sex assigned at birth can be um, complicated. And then in gender identity, gender expression, separating out physical attraction from emotional attraction, um, and there's versions of this that unfold in very endless and interesting ways. Um, interestingly also, you'll see a version of this as a gender-bred person. Um, there's a lot of debate over who owns it, who invented the, the complexity that's represented here, and that in fact resonates very, in very interesting ways with um, the idea of ownership of, identi of identity and authenticating identity. So I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, so in terms of popular culture, we've seen recently um, Asia Kate Dillon contest the categories for the Emmys, um, asking for recognition of a non-binary space between going for mm. best male, best female. Um, very interestingly, uh, Asia Kate describes coming to her understanding of non-binary identity through the character of uh, Taylor. And you know, through that exploration and the casting has now identifies as non-binary themselves. Um, I had a little bit of material here on uh, some of the fluid identities, uh, like Ruby Rose, and I've taken that out just in the interests of time. Um, but yes, I, th I, I guess in, in contrast to gender diversity and gender fluidity, uh, this non-binary space is increasingly contentious because of its claiming of a, either a third space or a or a desire to not be included in either the masculine or feminine space in categories like awards, toilets, bathrooms, etc. Um, in so this is from a Tumblr page. These pro proliferate on Tumblr. Non-binary uh, selfies is one of um, my favourite topics in terms of uh, the possibilities of self-representation rather than mainstream representation and the possibilities of sharing in interesting ways with uh, otherwise marginalised communities. You may not be able to see this here, but there's lots and lots of identities that you can identify with and tick box into. Um, and then there's an, an acknowledgement here of the, the inherent politics of these identity tags, the fact that um, you really are the person who can claim them yourself, uh, there's multiple ways of identifying, there's a non-binary, NB, trans, non-binary, etc. Um, please let us know if you have questions about tagging, but the idea of being able to tag your own identity and being able to be multiple identities at once is something that's really interesting, a really interesting platform accommodation, basically, of, of Tumblr compared with other social media spaces um, that are arguably more linear, like uh, perhaps Instagram. Um, in dating apps, we've also seen this uh, proliferation of categories. Okay, Cupid has now got 22 gender and 13 around orientation. And this is, this is my personal favourite, sapiosexual. It always resonates well in a conference space because it's around um, people who find smart people, intellectual people, attractive. Only calls a little, little giggle of, yes, oh, maybe I am sapiosexual after all. Um, the interesting thing about Facebook, uh, there's a great paper that I'll include in the, in the document with links, um, that is from Rena Bivens in, I think, 2010. So I'm not quite sure how Facebook currently does this, but this was about the time when um, Facebook was allowing lots more categories and you could also change your pronouns on Facebook. Uh, Rena did some research at the back end of this and discovered that actually all of these categories get folded back into pink or blue, regardless of how they're labelled in an open field. And I bet you can imagine why. It's for marketing. the purpose of marketing, yeah. How will we know which colour shoes to send you? All of the clothing that's, you know, obviously gendered. 
um, need to be either pink or blue. So, so the back end and the front end and um, you know, what really happens in these categories is one of the, the questions I've had a um, great time talking to Dean about. Um, so, and this is from a, an article I wrote very recently in Australia around gender diversity becoming more uh, acceptable in some ways in public spaces, um, but very contentious still. I was involved in a video that was basically explaining the idea of they pronouns. Um, there were multiple people in it who said you know, why they like them or, or how it made them feel good. Um, it got picked up sort of several months after it had actually been online by the Christian Bright, who then managed to uh, fan some fantastic um, news articles generated in mainstream press. It, you know, basically this moral panic and backlash that, that is actually not even truthful. Um, you know, we're not getting rid of he and her pronouns. Nobody's being forced to use they pronouns. Um, the, the experiment with they pronouns that was being uh, supported by the Victorian government was basically one day a month where you could wear a badge and have a discussion with somebody about what that meant to you, whether it was he, she, or they, or whatever you want to call yourself. It was a, it was a discussion starter. And so there's been similar debates in the armed services. Qantas have changed their language so that uh, people know that their staff are trained to refer to a partner rather than a husband or wife. Um, and these things obviously have history. You know, it was back in the 80s that we were intentionally degendering um, job titles and uses of they trace back to the 1300s and Shakespeare in terms of using them as singular. We're quite familiar with the language of saying, oh, we'll just wait for uh, them to come down the hallway if we don't know the gender of that person or, you know, your child goes to a doctor, you might ask with, oh, what did they say? Because we don't know what the doctor's gender is. Or alternately, we could do what a lot of people do and assume that the doctor is male. So, so these discussions around degendering language are not new, um, but I think we're seeing a lot more of the fake news kind of circulation and backlash, um, and moral panic. That kind of what about the children? And this is this is actually picked up from uh, new Ontario law which actually, when you read into the detail of it, centres the child's needs in any discussion around gender diversity. So if there's conflict between family and the child, um, there's an acknowledgement that the child actually has a perspective that we should listen to. So when it's respun, um, we're going to take the children away. If you don't like their gender diversity, we'll take them away from you and, you know, there. <laughs> so this is where we're at. Hello, please come in. Um, so, what do we mean when we make a category? What is the use of it? On one hand, it's an important mechanism for eliminating and eliminating inequality. We were talking about this before. You know, how do we how do we have uh, affirmative action that addresses um, stigmatisation or discrimination if we don't know that community exists? So, historically, there's obviously a significance in meaning making. However, how often do we actually have power over how that category is interpreted and used? And how often do we have the experience where um, a category that may have been measured for, for positive purposes uh, gets turned around and is used as the grounds for discrimination? Um, I guess from this, we, you can kind of, so it's complicated in terms of imposing categories and especially if you're not going to be consultative with, with how communities or people uh, choose to identify themselves. I think this discussion of, of the cost of not measuring, our presumption has always been that we should measure um, and a lot of this I think has actually come from patriarchy, capitalism. I was with a group recently that is lobbying to have gender removed from birth certificates which seems like a really radical idea, but they pointed out that since marriage equality in Australia, that was actually the point originally of, of having male or female on a, on a birth certificate was that you could then prove same-sex marriage and that shouldn't exist. So, so there's kind of a recursive uh, questioning of, of why these categories exist and what benefit are they actually? What, what use, like why do we need gender on a birth certificate? Um, the economic uh, underpinning of headlines like this, I think, is one of the things that is most powerfully leveraged in 
Um, some, we've got a, a network across Australia now called Pride in Diversity that works with banks and corporates around um, acknowledging that actually having a more diverse uh, representation on boards and more diverse um, acceptance in their policies, they'll actually make more money. So, so we can see that some of uh, these arguments are being leveraged in that space. Um, meanwhile, we have, so this section of the talk goes into a little bit of uh, some of the, the tricky things around measuring and interpreting categories in, in different ways. Um, these are probably, the, the GLAD one you may be familiar with um, doesn't split into non-binary gender diversity but uh, presumes that in or, or has found evidence that in this younger age range up to 20% um, of the population identify as LGBTQ. Interestingly they don't use the I which has absolutely been an Australian um, acronyms for quite some time so again we see uh, you know, acknowledgement of intersex as being part of a community or in fact not wanting to be part of a community because they often have very different political needs too. Um, oh, and sorry, I was going to tell you about this other one. So this is actually the, the project I was talking about where we worked with young people. Um, it's called Scrolling Beyond Binaries. Um, you can Google that and find uh, the whole website that tells us about the space. We interviewed about 1,300, or we surveyed about 1,300 young people across Australia around their uses of social media. Um, and then we did follow-up qual interviews with a smaller number of them. Um, what was interesting in, in this statistic was up to 20% were identifying as non-binary and or gender diverse. And so a lot of them were using uh, open fields to self-describe in that space. And we had lots of interesting discussions there around you know, whether you would remove the open fields that where people had said, I'm an attach Apache attack helicopter because it's dirty data, or whether you actually attempt to follow up to understand what, and so an Apache attack helicopter is kind of a resistant, um, you know, I guess it's almost speaking to that discourse of this is all political correct correctness and I don't agree, that's how it tends to be interpreted. Um, but, you know, what does it really mean unless we actually ask the individuals that have populated that field with those words? So 20% obviously is, you know, much larger than, than we assume in a mainstream environment. So meanwhile, we have the mainstream environment of the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Our last census was in 2016, um, and they did an experimental rollout. They, they sent to 30,000 houses a printed version where you had um, an open field on gender and the capacity to put in something other than male and female. Everybody else just got the normal form, where you were male or female. Unless you knew about this possibility online, you could then ring the office and access the digital online one, where again you had an open field. Um, and so, I was saying before, at, at universal level the whole thing was a disaster because the system actually crashed for six hours on the night of the census, meaning that everybody who was relying on actually using the online version actually couldn't even access it. Um, so there's some discussion about whether or not we'll ev ever actually have another census, um, which is somewhat put to bed the argument that even you know, measuring and allowing a third category will break the, the clean data of before, because if we've got, we've previously you know, been, had 50% of the population and 50% of the population adds up to 100%, now if we're measuring all of these other things, they might not add up to 100% and that would break the... the so I'm sure the sociologists in the room can give that much more depth than I give it. I do the very simple rendering of it, but um, you know, it's the computer says no argument, which is <laughs> the next slide, <laughs> is is not really a valid one in that we actually do have technology and systems for for measuring the differences in between categories, and it's not impossible. You just have to be uh, thoughtful. But but going back to the uh, the st stats on this, so the, there was a public announcement from the ABS acknowledging that of course this trial um, wasn't representative of uh, the community because it was finite um, and, and that access was a large issue in terms of self-identification. But what was really interesting, the contrast between the people who had um, access to the open category and those that didn't, it was you were 50 times more likely to use the open field to identify gender diversity than those that didn't have the option. Now that, it sounds a little bit, um, I don't know if you'll be able to add those 
systems up in terms of the stats. But but the 50, just take away the, the because of the open field, you're 50 times more likely to actually describe yourself in something that is not male or female. That breaks my brain a little bit. And of course, this is one of the arguments that gets picked up again by um, critics of gender diversity that, that actually just allowing people to be gender diverse, you know, we're, we're actually programming them to be gender diverse. The possibility kind of invokes the, the reality. Uh, now I forgot to start timing myself at the beginning. So I'm about, uh, I need to speak up just a little bit. You um, took 20 minutes. Yeah, cool. So these are the, some of the research questions that I'm uh, working with. Um, these ideas of um, so-called emergent gender identities, maybe they are, maybe they've not, maybe they've always been part of our cultures, but, but the idea of multiplicity and fluidity, how do we make these visible, intelligible and measurable? Intelligible being, you know, do we accept and understand what they mean to different people? Um, and how has this changed past? present and future, which is obviously where the archives and, and the data futures kind of uh, surround the, the present politics. And so how can these in-between identities be reconciled with previous binary gendered data sets and archives in which there were no categories for them? So in my tiny amount of time at uh, the archives, I'm seeking any kind of uh, representation of non-binary genders. Um, and m the main way I've been able to do that is to look through androgyny as a, as a parallel term, or in some cases, um, transmasculine. You know, these are not, these are not, non-binary is not a, a search term in this space. Um, and what consequences are there for the future of archives, um, big data and AI in particular, if you think about facial recognition um, and how hormones actually do change facial structures a little, um, but also are not very, AI systems are not very nuanced and really can't even deal with race at the moment. They're, you know, big data sets are, are trained on a norm, which is invariably seen as white and masculine and quite often in good health, you know, not gaunt. <laughs> Um, so what might design justice look like in, in, you know, with an intentional understanding of the difficulties of categorisation and acknowledgement of the in-betweens? In terms of uh, scholarship, these are the, some of the very beautiful, colourful covers of, of the scholars that I'm working with. Um, you'll be familiar with Barad and Crenshaw in terms of uh, intersectionality and I guess really bringing some of the thinking of race as category um, to gender complexity um, and Sarah Ahmed's work thinking through you know how, how the relationship between the what is seen and what is embodied is is complicated according to perspective. Um, Rosie Gray Doddy's work on the post human uh, looks at intersections beyond just humanity and you know thinks through the the relationship we have with the earth with the trees with animals with data with with the world in much more complex ways and yeah there's uh, I guess lots of interesting arguments there around um, how those things are assigned agency or not how do we see the agency of data if we've programmed it does it have a voice and a and a authority of its own particularly um, with intuitive learning systems and, and AI. Um, and intimate citizenship and Testo Junkie are both kind of bringing a, an embodied uh, ethnographic kind of storytelling perspective to, to a biopolitics in both cases. Um, and then we've got people like Ricky Wilkins, who's fantastic in, in these provocations in popular commentary. Um, this article was coming out of a discussion they had with a friend whose um, child adult child identified as, uh, was using they pronouns, but was very happy about being cisgender. So does, what happens in, if, uh, am I non-binary, am I genderqueer, what, is this the end of trans? You know, what does, what does this mean in terms of how um, transgender people have identified in binary terms in some communities, in some times? Um, and it touches on some of the, the in-community hostilities that um, I certainly saw with the smaller communities that I was working with in Adelaide, um, which population size maybe like seems 
parallel to Victoria, um, where there was a, a big gap between the older binary trans community and younger non-binary genderqueer people. And a sort of sense that, that and this came through in interviews in interesting ways actually, that um, the harder it was to win the category, you know, if, if you've fought all your life to actually transition from male to female and identify as a transgender woman, the harder it is to accept that somebody else might be blurring that, that uh, definition and that uh, neat, safe. So it's really thinking of categories as, as both protective and restrictive. And, you know, they are both things. Um, I'm not going to play this, but this is a fabulous little two-minute clip if you want to use in classrooms for the parallels between quantum theory and uh, queer identity. Um, Amru al Qadi is a, is a writer and performer in the UK, and this was part of um, a Future Fest festival just very recently. Does some great mapping on, you know, the ideas of... And it's actually drawing on Barad's stuff around... Um, uh, quantum physics and particles that simultaneously pass through two gates. They don't actually choose a separate gate. They mm. can be in two places at once. It's awesome stuff. And if you're thinking about, um, you know, the very binary categories of bathrooms, for example, this again starts to break your brain. Um, and, uh, this is really in here to remind us that, of course, you know, our binary categories are actually very culturally specific. We haven't always necessarily understood the world in these gendered ways. This expression, um, I visited in Vancouver the uh, Museum of Anthropology, the idea that everything depends on everything else, um, and I'm not able to pronounce that, um, comes from Haida culture. And so the, the significance of, of understanding ancestral origins and complexity, you know, we can look to some of uh, these backgrounds to actually add a bit more depth to our understandings. Right, I'm going to hop into the case studies. So uh, the case studies that I've been doing with groups are, are basically resting on this idea that um, when we represent ourselves in online spaces, um, we often are representing ourselves as fragments. Um, either in everyday ways, but also it, on, on everyday occasions, but also in everyday ways. So, you know, food selfies as well as shoofies, which is, you know, the lovely shoofies, shoofies, which is, you know, the nice carpet, or this is where I'm standing today and these are my shoes. <laughs> so, you know, the quotidian everyday kind of ideas. Um, so Stories Beyond Gender is also a website. Um, this is a project I did with a group of people in Adelaide over a kind of 18 month, two year period. We met once a month or so for three or four hours, did a whole lot of different kinds of creative activities ranging from um, face painting, dress ups, uh, very uh, digital oriented activities where people were getting into digital um, illustration. Um, the idea that was whatever we were doing manifesting in material terms would, would be have a digital trace and be have a digital manifestation. So we also were exploring um, platforms like Tumblr, um, things like uh, haiku, gender haiku in, on Twitter. Um, so, you know, working across mediums, platforms and styles of self-representation and often um, in ways that were intentionally uh, non-identifiable. So I use pseudonymity here rather than anonymity with recognition that actually any one of us recognising, even if that's your knee, if I tell Michael over here that actually you know that's Michael's knee, then it's no longer an a anonymous knee, it is actually Michael's knee. And you can go and tell the Christian right that Michael's knee is a very bad knee and actually shouldn't get any more funding. <laughs> so that's a very, you know, the, the link between um, legal identity and anonymous identity. I don't even presume to work with storytellers anymore with the idea that they could be completely anonymous online um, because any trace can be revealed eventually. But, you know, thinking through uh, the agency and, and the way you want to present yourself is very significant. Um, Oh, actually, before I get to that next slide, I, so this actually, this work came really out of working with um, parents of trans kids who were really uh, activists wanting to change the world in very public ways, but in being a parent of a trans child, you are going to be, uh, you know, revealing the identity of your trans child potentially, um, 
the trans child may not grow up to choose to be a trans child, they may choose their binary gender and it's very difficult to then conceal that trace. So these are tensions between um, activism that celebrates and, and activism that stigmatises and the, the impossibility of um, future-proofing against these things. You know, it's not, a, it's not an unusual story to hear um, parents having all of the consent and enthusiasm of a nine-year-old and when the nine-year-old becomes 13 and goes to high school, there's a different um, understanding of safety and, you know, if they have the opportunity to, to not be out to all of their friends, they, they may well take that option and that's fine. Um, so Code Switching Identities uh, is the project that I'm working on now as a kind of uh, ongoing basis. It's, it's unpacking and exploring some of these same ideas around who are we, how do we see ourselves, who represents us. So you can see here, unlike the first question of who are you, this is um, plural and so really invites you to think about collectives and you know, in a gender diverse group that is inclusive of young people and older people who have binary and non-binary understandings of gender. You know, do, do we have the same agendas? Are we the same we or are we different we's? Um, all of these questions about who represents us um, inevitably become very uh, political and people always have something to say about Caitlyn Jenner at this point. Um, so, you know, regardless of how you feel about Caitlyn Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner is not representative of all gender diversity or all transgender people. And so, you know, this is an invitation for us to really think about how we might do that on our own terms. Um, and then I guess the digital and the, the thinking through how we share, who we share with, when we share, what we share. Part of that question of who are we is, you know, are you more yourself here now or are you more yourself at home? And are you different selves in those two different places? And, you know, even when you're at home, are you yourself when you're talking to your kids or when you're in bed with your lover? It's like these are different aspects of self that we accept as being in contrast with one another, but they're not incoherent. They're, they're part of all of us. Um, I'm going to skip that slide because sometimes it doesn't... When you pour water into this glass, it illustrates refraction the arrow turns the other way. So the idea of a selfie as refraction, as a creative workaround, rather than just definitively being me taking a camera of my face at arm's length, you know, I can take photos of my shoes and they can represent who I am. I can use the pano function on my camera and, you know, walk through space and get sliced up kind of aspects of my body that, that in abstract represent how I understand my identity. So uh, refraction and diffraction, and of course this Oh, there you go, it's doing it now. I just needed to uh, press the button again. Um, this is a, a lovely way of illustrating some of the ways that um, post-phenomenologists and post-humanists think through diffraction as well. And so we, uh, one of the interesting things I think in, t in terms of playing with uh, creative processes and workshop processes with a group of gender diverse people, we're not there necessarily to integrate interrogate the meaning of gender diversity or, or what it means to ourselves. We're there to create something. And so it becomes playful and less confronting. Um, you know, there's discussions around uh, how things feel and, and sound or smell rather than necessarily the visual. Um, so while we're working at, at the end with a lot of visual outputs, um, the processes are not exclusively visual. We are also thinking about text and and abstracts. Um, I've already talked a little bit about pseudonymity. So this is now where we get to see some of the things that people have made. Um, quite often there was text that accompanied the image, which was really useful in kind of um, unpacking some of the, the descriptive ways that people were, were intending their representations to be read. Um, so this is a, a non-binary representation talking about emerging from the shadows. Um, this, a lot of us uh, did this as a kind of, in, uh, so we ended up, I should just jump forward a little bit, in, as part of the, the process of the uh, initiative, the workshops were one component, they were all online, they're all part of this Stories Beyond Gender website, so there's kind of a gallery in that space that, that allows you to scroll through and see all of the things that were made. There's also blogs in that space where people can offer their own personal context. Um, on what they've created. 
lots of people were telling us that they'd seen the space and, and enjoyed it, but there was kind of a, it was remote and it was online and virtual. So there was kind of a call from the community to actually make these things material again in a, in a physical exhibition where we actually put it in a gallery and, and you know, curated uh, the space so that you would walk through a kind of journey of discovery of gender identity and you know, different stages where people had made visual work that was about um, you know, having arguments with TERFs or, or dealing with people on the bus or so opposition and then, you know, celebration. And so there was kind of um, a unification around these narrative moments that, that was really lovely to actually walk through in a physical space. And of course, then we wanted something that was enduring across time. So we made a zine out of, uh, and I think I may have showed that to you last year. I certainly intended to post some to you. So if I haven't done that, I will absolutely do that this time. Um, so the zine was intended to circulate beyond uh, the community that were actually in the room. They were the sort of things that you could take and leave in a doctor's surgery or in um, school you know, reception with the idea that other people would pick them up and take away these little fragments of selves and you know, learn some different things as they went. Um, so further on this idea of fragmentation, we also did these montages where people looked at different aspects of their bodies. And this one, you know, you may or may not recognise this person unless um, you know, you know him or you actually look for his Tumblr space. So it's pseudonymous, it's not anonymous. Um, but these are aspects of uh, their gender story. Of course, tattoos always have excellent stories. Um, this is a nipple that if you see it in detail, you can see there's a slight scar and evidence of um, top surgery. More body hair, less body hair and a spirit animal. And a lot of people actually worked in really interesting ways with eyes as being, um, you know, explicit ways of seeing and being seen. This piece is called is about, uh, you know, going out and ex playing with uh, makeup for a few times. It's called um, mascara drama. So this is the the disastrous kind of you know <laughs> experiment with mascara. Um, and this one, you know, we've seen lots of the before and afters. Uh, that are used in mainstream press and are quite disturbing to trans people. Um, you know, it's one thing to post them yourself in spaces like YouTube or, or you know, wherever your online um, place of choice is. The, the agency involved in intentionally bringing together before and after um, pictures, I think, is quite different. And this one, um, I think they just had the best time in kind of matching these slightly crazy facial expressions and pointing to this kind of humour that um, they regarded as, as core and, you know, being there throughout transition and, and is always part of who they are. And Stephanie certainly was a... Um, she was my provocateur in, in um, a workshop environment. Whenever I was rambling too much or not making sense, she would just go, what, like, what? can you just tell us what to do now? Can you just tell us what to do? <laughs> so this was very, uh, a, a challenge to me in terms of not owning the workshop. I was very keen on, um, you know, it being grassroots and you guide yourselves and you work out what you want to do and it's not up to me to guide it. But there were times where it needed instruction. Um, this is some of the digital art that was made. So we worked with the idea of memes um, that could be picked up and circulated beyond um, a, a given context. And yeah, certainly this idea of kind of difference and, and how you think about yourself emerged many times with I should not have to hate you to be me. Um, this piece is called Girl Cock. And in the exhibition, we, had, uh, we were in a community space for one of the exhibitions and the person was a little bit disturbed about what kids would think if they saw it. Um, so we were asked to take the title down but leave the um, description because it's a, it's a cuddly cushion, right? That's how she's represented her girl cog. It was kind of the thing of if any child is going to love an image of, you know, trans identity and read the description, I just think this is ideal. So it was very, um, you know, interesting negotiating these things in public spaces and, yeah, we learnt lots from it. Um, this is another, another version of a, of a montage. You can see here... Uh, the numbers, like there's a 444 four, four just in the background here and 1111. Does that signify anything to you, this group? No. I, I, I haven't asked the storyteller about this one, but somebody in a group that I was presenting to recently told me that this is a lucky thing when the numbers all align. So they're transition points in your life where you get this kind of opportunity to go, oh, yeah. where am I right now? What, you know, how am I? Like it's a checking kind of um, moment, a lucky moment. 
So I thought that was, you know, that, that there's always these layers of significance that may or may not be evident to audiences. Um, this is the one that I've used often as the kind of publicity um, poster for, for recruiting people into workshops, I think. Um, and in the exhibition, we actually had mirrors positioned around uh, the exhibition space so that as a viewer, you'd occasionally find, you know, reflections of yourself and be invited to think about whether that's, is that really you? Because it's a representation of you or is it <coughs> actually what you think of me? Like, does it feel the same to be inside my skin as to look at a reflection of my skin? So mirrors were a very uh, common theme. So I'm almost, I think, at my... A few more minutes. A few more minutes. Um, these were, I guess, some of the objectives that I was working towards. I guess um, one of the things that I'm still working through is how to make these less tangible um, traces of research useful in a, in a policy and education context. We still need data in terms of being able to speak back to opposition around what non-binary gender identity is. Um, and so one of the things I'm doing as we go is asking people to actually do some self-recording um, in, a, in a more or less survey form where they'll use an open space to say, at home I identify as lazy, at work I identify as productive. And the intention is, is then to use all of these data categories to reveal you know, the, the complete abundance of ways that people describe themselves um, beyond gender identity. Um, I guess just in wrapping up, there's, is, there's coming back to this space of why this work uh, and why we need you know, as much of this work as, as possible and it's quite urgent is I see um, you know, some of the, the significance of uh, working with machines and data systems as being, they're going to happen anyway and we need to work out how to actually engage with them in complex and interesting ways rather than reductive ways that that end up repeating some of the um, the systemic problems that we've lived with for a long time. Um, this one is an example. This is a collection that I'll actually again put in the links, um, a collection that came out of MIT as student essays. And this one in particular is fabulous. Do you know this author, Sasha Costanza Chok? Um, so a trans woman uh, who's done a fabulous thing on travelling while trans and this is particularly interesting for me with, I have an X in my passport, a non-binary non passport, which is not recognised in the States. There's pink and blue uh, possibilities in terms of walking through the body scanners. Um, if the person at the gate thinks that my body doesn't match up with how my body scans, then I can be taken aside and interrogated and, you know, whatever, miss all my flights and all the, all the things. The, I know some really established fantastic trans people who don't travel to the States at all because of the fear of this stuff happening. So the consequences are much beyond, you know, the actual complaints. We can't look at complaints as a, as a representative cost to this um, possibility. And, you know, in, in a non-binary gender identity, what part of my body doesn't measure up to blue or pink? This is, this is kind of, a, this is the thing that can make Border Patrol's very angry and, you know, because it threatens understandings of identity that are, that are clearly very well established. Um, this is a book I came across about face value, you know, the power of first impressions on one hand, but this is also interesting in terms of asking people to recognise how they perceive, uh, read trust in different faces. And as you slide the scale from black, black to white and from masculine to feminine, people will have quite different responses around trust and the judgments that they're making. And these are often, so, you know, it's most ever, this is the same uh, base skeleton, but zooming in on the changes in shape and reflectance make faces appear dominant or submissive. Um, these are some of the same principles that are being used in AI and facial recognition um, things. We're just about to roll out uh, My Health Records in Australia, which is a um, a, a record keep, a, an online record keeping space that we're supposed to be able to control. People are very scared of it because of hacking and surveillance, um, which are valid fears. Um, so a lot of people are opting out. Um, and it, 
in the discussion around it, there's been a lot of discussion over, over who can access the records and who can modify the records. And there's a couple of examples, you know, as an as a intersex person, you may or may not know your intersex status. A lot of intersex people don't find out um, that what they were assigned at birth was actually arbitrary until much later. And in this system, you could actually find that out without any social context to support you in what that means. Um, and then there's also the surveillance questions around, uh, you know, if you're suspected of being a terrorist, then actually, yes, your information was private, but now we can actually do whatever we like with it and put it wherever we like and, you know, make whatever meaning out of it we like. Um, and this is really just to bring us back to the, to the understanding of the continuity between um, data histories and futures, the politics of naming. So um, this is uh, the back cover of Gender Trash, and I think this slide's been taken from the Digital Transgender Archives as being, um, you know, a, one of their items. And, the, and it's a cut-up piece talking about, um, yeah, if you're going to call us trannies and trans, then we'll call you stupid dicks and wee-wees. Time for you to grow up. <laughs> so that is that. Um, this is the call to arms, resist reductionism, embrace complexity. <laughs> And I would really love to hear your thoughts and yeah, thank you very much.